The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. I will talk about a dynamic shear rheometer that commonly used by different DOTs. The main purpose of this device is to characterize viscoelastic properties of asphalt binder. That's the main purpose. This project I got from Texas Department of Transportation. The idea was, can we modify the dynamic shear rheometer to measure the cement paste rheology? That was the project from the DOT. As this is a very commonly used technique by different duties, the device is available, so we can increase the versatility of that particular device to measure both asphalt and cement and use as a practical, relatively inexpensive technique that can be used in the field to measure the cement paste rheology before the concrete placed. So you are going to detect those if any abnormalities within one to two hours so that you can still fix the problem and place the concrete. That was the idea. So the objective was to investigate whether the potential cement, mineral, and chemical admixture in compatibilities in concrete that can effectively be identified through the direct measurement of cement paste rheology. The other speakers already talk about chemistry behind it, the mechanism behind it. I'm not at all talking that. I'm just talking about the test, the practical test. So the approach was modify the dynamic shear rheometer and then apply that to measure the cement paste rheology and then whether that can distinguish between the normal and incompatible mix and then validating this result. This is a dynamic shear rheometer, so we used another rheometer, relatively advanced, to validate the results and make sure that whatever we are measuring, that absolute values are correct. And then developing some acceptance criteria to give the DOT the range, the which range is normal and which range is not normal. We all understand this slide that we already talked about, that there is a complex interaction sometimes, that is the C3A content of the cement, sulfate availability in the pore solution from the cement, and the mineral admixture and the chemical, the different interaction and competition makes sometimes incompatibility. And the common issues, we all understand that it's a setting time issues, workability issues, and it ultimately leads to durability issues and cracking issues. Early detection. Now we all understand we can measure a concrete rheology directly, but you know, the variability of those techniques are really questionable, and practical use is difficult, labor intensive. Cement paste is a fundamental, it's very accurate, and if we can simulate the condition of cement paste in concrete, like aggregate sharing effect, then probably it's the best way to do that to predict the concrete incompatibility based on the cement paste. And the previous research on measuring cement paste rheology by parallel plate fluid rheometer and the rotational viscometer was found to be very effective to distinguish mixtures with different admixture dosage and water cement ratio. So those are the background information before starting the work. Now this is the modification that we made you see the left side, this picture, this is the dynamic shear rheometer. It's a parallel plate rheometer. And you see the, they keep the, the asphalt sample here, and they, between the two plates, it's just rotate. So this is the asphalt. They use this to measure the asphalt uh, viscoelastic properties. What are the areas modification that we noticed? That the same fluid jacket we cannot use for cement paste. And because there are very smooth plate, if we don't use any kind of shear-rated surface, the slippage will introduce some error. And also the evaporation of the cement pairs during measurement is also, so we need to make it sealing so that there will be no evaporation loss. So we need to do this kind of modification. So this is the sealing cap to minimize the evaporation. And we introduced a grid paper, which is 240 grid paper to give some texture 
You see this paper here? And then also we totally changed the heating system. This is a call after modification, this is called fluid jacket. So the water doesn't come in contact with the cement paste. Those are the modifications we made. And also we did some preliminary investigation to know the gap between the two plates. And we found out that one millimeter gap is optimum, it gives better repeatability. We also selected the zero to 200 seconds, that shear rate, that best repeatability. We develop a high shear mixing procedure based on NIST and Portland Cement Association. This is a shear rate sweeping mode. And we also use another rheometer to verify the DSR results. Those are the preliminary work we did and optimize the system. We also use the commonly used the calorimeter and also setting time just to as a supporting tools. Now this is the design of experiment. We use two types of cement with a varying C3A content. This is the main purpose is to reproduce some of the past actual field incompatibilities in the lab. So these are the suggestions provided by DOT. Use this kind of lignin-based water reducing admixture with the two different source, typical dose and double dose, class F, class C, and slag. And temperature is also very important. DOT noticed that some of the mix, a normal temperature or this temperature, just works fine. But the same mix becomes incompatible at low temperature. Now the procedure, this is called static mode. Although it's a dynamic shear but we used at the beginning as a static mode. So we use all the material needs to be stored in the different temperature, and then mixing at the temperature controlled high shear mixing that we develop, it takes around 4.5 minutes. We actually use a different three millimeter, a milliliter syringe that we put after mixing the cement paste, we put those in a different temperature, and then placing the cement paste one by one of the syringe and then you, with a five syringe with a different temperature interval. So we just keep the sample, measure it, and then after 30 minutes take another syringe and put it and measure it. So that's what you call static mode. This is the static mode and the Bingham model, and we know that this is the shear stress and shear rate, and the slope of that, we use the up curve and down curve. The slope is plastic viscosity, and the intercept is yield stress. Now this is the typically we did for as an example. That's the good fit of the lower curve. And you see there are different curb with a different time interval. And so we get plastic viscosity for each curb, and then we calculate the rate. The time versus plastic viscosity, and the slope is the rate of plastic viscosity. Similarly, rate of yield stress. So it is not an absolute value. It's a rate of change of plastic viscosity and yield stress over time, 90 minutes. This is the rate of change of plastic viscosity. You see here, when I'm using the control mix without any admixture and fly S35, this is the values that we're getting with a rate of plastic viscosity. But then when you use a double dosage, that's a typical dosage F35, those are the, see the values are decreasing. Similarly here, when class CS, the values are high, but when you are using like double dose of class C, typical dose of class C are giving an abnormal range of rate of change of plastic viscosity. Similarly, the rate of change of yield stress. You see here, that those are the control mix, but here, when you use fly as 35%, and typical dose of that D17, it's kind of marginal. But when you increase the double dose, almost all the mix below that line, similarly class CS, similarly the slag here. When you use 50% slag with the double dose of that admix, the values are pretty low values. So then, from this analysis, testing results, we did analysis, and then uh, I will talk about the ranges later, but then I give the results for the heat of hydration, and we heat of hydration, we use calorimeter, we calculate the integrated heat evolution. This is the cement only. We compare with the cement with the all other mixture and then calculate the percentage of heat evolution. And you see that this is 100% heat evolution. In compared to the original, the heat evolution curve is changing, is decreasing. And you see this line is around 23. Below 23, those mixes are either very low temperature or double doses of admixture. Those are as incompatible mixes. Those are below 23 and 23 to 35 marginal. Anything above are normal. So now I try to use this technique to support 
the measurement based on rate of change of plastic viscosity and rate of change of yield stress. Now this is the comparison. This is the results of 24 degrees Celsius. You see the setting time and those are all makes identified as incompatible. Of course those makes are artificially created incompatible makes in the lab. You see the, this is the rate of change of plastic viscosity. This is rate of change of yield stress in initial setting time and final setting time and the percentage heat evolution. Whenever we are getting abnormal range of heat evolution, it is matching with the rate of change of plastic viscosity and rate of change of yield. So those are also in an abnormal range and the setting time is also not normal. These are all changes, except this one a little bit close, otherwise setting time. So from this slide, and also if you go to 35 degrees Celsius, some of the incompatible mixes based on heat evolution is supporting the rate of change of plastic viscosity and rate of change of yield stress. So we are getting support from the heat evolution curve. Now the question is, these are the marginal mixes. So the almost all incompatible mixes are identified by heat evolution criteria, so abnormal ranges of rate of change of plastic viscosity and rate of change of yield stress. Now the question is that calorimeter is commonly used but calorimeter takes minimum 24 hours time to take a decision. What we are talking about that by this, just we need only one and a half hours. Then based on all the testing that we did, we develop a criteria. For the incompatible mix or poor mixes, the RPB range, the rate of change of plastic viscosity is equal to or below 0 0.0198. For marginal, this is the range, and for normal, it should be higher than this. Similarly, rate of change of yield stress. So those are the criteria based on the static mode we developed. Before going to the dynamic mode, we actually did a mini slump test because we know the mini slump using cement paste is uh, also a measure of workability. So this is the mini cone setup, the way we do the concrete slump, similar things. And so what we did is we measured the pat area after different time interval with all the mixes that we tested. And so we recorded the pat area change over time. And now we compare these results with the, see this is the five minute, we did a lot of comparison, only the good comparison that I got relatively better that I'm showing here. Five minute pat area shows a relatively good correlation with the absolute values of the yield stress. And that makes sense because both are giving the workability measurement. <coughs> And also it's not that good, but it's still better correlation with the absolute value of plastic viscosity with five minute pat area. Now, if you compare with the heat evolution, see the heat evolution is in the X axis and Y axis is the pat area slump loss and not getting a good correlation. That means the criteria based on heat evolution doesn't really support the mini slump. So from these results we can say that the mini slump also you can be used, but it gives the partial information. It doesn't really give the full picture. It may give workability information. It just could show a good correlation with the yield stress, but you may miss sometimes based on mini slump, you may miss to identify the problematic situation sometimes. So it may not give you an absolute answer all the time, but mini slump is very user friendly technique and people may want to use it, but really we didn't do a very detailed work using mini slum. Now we go to dynamic. Because we use a dynamic shareometer, we're supposed to measure that in a dynamic mode. At the beginning, the project was moving in the static mode, and then later on we found that this is also an option. We repeated almost all, but not all, basically. But we did a significant amount of work with the dynamic mode also. What we do is, in dynamic mode, similar to the asphalt binder system, we record the storage modulus over time. So we put the cement paste, so it is not like you take a syringe and, and then after 30 minutes another syringe and put not. Cement paste is there, you are recording over time. It's a dynamic. These are the good work that we found and we need to introduce some of the initial parameter that we did. The initial micro strain, the 50 micro strain that you need to apply, we did preliminary work, we found that 50 micron is good to remove those thixotropic reversible phenomena, and then actually measured the rheology property due to cement hydration. So those kind of things, after doing that, 
So this is the actual measurement uh, of a particular mix, just to show an example. So storage modulus over time, and then we try to model it and calculate those three parameters, alpha, beta, and tau. This is the magnitude parameter, so it's the ultimate uh, slope and shift. See if we, in alpha, if it is increases, the alpha goes up, and then you know if it is your beta, tau increases, the curve goes this way, and the beta increases, the curve goes that way. So we got those three parameters. Now see whether these three parameters, whether it's useful to develop those criteria to differentiate between incompatible and compatible. Now I show the comparison between all the incompatible mix based on heat evolution, the conduction calorimeter. Now compare with the values of alpha, tau, and beta. And it shows that alpha parameter, the ultimate storage modulus that we calculated, that gives a nice correlation with the findings of the results based on the heat evolution. And then we develop acceptance criteria that, you know, these are not very useful parameters, but this is really good, and we can differentiate based on alpha parameter, the incompatible marginal and normal mix. So the general acceptance criteria with alpha parameter was established regardless of the cement and ACM types and the temperature condition. And dynamic rheology test can also be used to identify the incompatible mixes. So the conclusion that we actually modified the DSR and it is capable of measuring the cement paste rheology with permissible repeatability. I didn't show the results, but we did a significant amount of repeatability and most of the coefficient of variation below 10% and sensitivity. We artificially created um, incompatible and compatible mix are distinguished properly and they're capable to distinguish between the normal and incompatible mix. In static mode, the rate of change of rheological parameters was found to be more sensitive than the absolute values of rheological parameters. And the rate of change of plastic viscosity is more sensitive than the rate of change of yield stress. In dynamic mode, the alpha parameter was found to be the storage modulus, ultimate storage modulus was found to be good to establish the criteria and that also can be used. So the thing is that both dynamic and static mode is useful. Whatever way is convenient, you can do it. And the observations based on rheological parameters are strongly supported by the heat evolution and setting time data. A generalized acceptance criteria, irrespective of the supplementary cementitious or, or temperature is developed. So we still need to do some work it needs the round-robin testing program to validate the applicability of the modified DSR to measure cement paste rheology with permissible. We need to do the round-robin testing and definitely further refinement of the acceptance criteria. It needs some more data just to make sure the fine-tuning of those criteria and actually need to test a different kind of mix, a real mix maybe, because some of the mix are double dosages, artificially created mix. So different type of practical mix needs to be tested and validated. And of course, this is the main purpose is that these techniques need to be used in the field. So we need a field validation and implementation. And that's what I am trying to get an implementation project. So this is the ultimate goal. This will ultimately help concrete producers and district laboratories to detect problematic combinations of concrete ingredients during the mix design process. So in the field, during the mix design process, if you detect any problem, then you still have time to fix it before placement. And a conduction calorimeter cannot serve that properly. It takes a little more time. So that's the main purpose. And thank you.